The Shepherd Program began in 1997 through the generous support of Tom and Nancy Shepherd and through really the innovative, visionary educational leadership of Harlan Beckley, the original founder of the program. I met Tom Shepard well over a decade ago and I just absolutely love the man. He was an impressive man, he was humble, he was kind, he never met a person that he didn't want to talk to or engage with. Having said that, he didn't want to just give his money to a program and watch them spend it. He wanted to guide them and nurture them and he absolutely did that. Over 20 years ago, uh, my friend Harlan Beckley got a group of us together, about six of us or so, to talk about this grand innovative idea he had for a program where we would study together the, uh, with students, faculty and staff, the causes and consequences of poverty. And we were all on board. We just wanted to know how we could help him. And I started teaching courses that were cross-listed between economics and the Shepherd program uh, from the outset. And the goal was from the beginning to prepare students to address the problems associated with poverty in both their professional lives and their civic lives by offering both coursework and community engagement opportunities. Well, the Shepherd program from the beginning was important to a lot of students. Slowly, it became an integral part of the student's education, and slowly it became a minor. It was always interdisciplinary. It always involved both coursework and engagement. At first, it was mostly through summer internships, but then not very long after that, we began a lot of engagement in the local community. And then I remember being told that I had more advisees than anybody in the university. Why? Just because all the minors were my advisees. Like a lot of startups, it did not happen overnight and it was a series of events, starting with Tom Shepard, but also uh, with the support of Washington and Lee. A lot of people who become familiar with the program can't help but be enthusiastic about it. It was quite a band of brothers and sisters that ultimately contributed, but uh, they didn't get there overnight, but slowly but surely they did. In most cases, students initiated new aspects of the Shepard program. I think it's important that students started these programs because it indicates how excited they were about the possibilities of a sustained education that involved both internships and community engagement and work in the course room that would lead to an impact and transformative impact on their careers and their civic lives. In a similar way, the classes that are being offered, it's really just a function of the faculty here. So as new faculty come to campus, um, many of them across a variety of disciplines decide that they want to get active in the poverty program. And so they each have something unique to offer. Um, and the program just kind of evolves. I think one of the highlights or the great strengths of the Shepherd program is the professional staff and the leadership that that program has had over um, its life course to date. Being a dear friend of Harlan is the least exclusive club in America. I've been very impressed at the wide, diverse number of people that know and love him from all walks of life, uh, all young and old alike, and uh, you know, Harlan is an inspiration to us all, and it has been a highlight of my last 10 years getting to know him better. Harlan uh, was a very good leader. He was uh, developing courses, teaching them, um, generating a culture in the program that was not hierarchical, that was a partnership between faculty, students, and staff. And when he transitioned out and Howard Pickett transitioned in, uh, Howard has just been a fantastic um, leader following Harlan. I see the large collection of faculty and staff and students that we have in the Shepherd program almost as a little policy school inside Washington and Lee, and it's very invigorating to be part of that. I think it's just a transformational program. Uh, not only is it good for the students, uh, but I think it's changed the whole, the whole landscape of the campus, uh, from the faculty to the administration uh, to the parents. Uh, and, and to the uh, agencies that they serve and ultimately the, the underserved people.
in some ways it's almost unrecognizable from what it was when I participated 20 years ago. Except clearly the core is still there, right? The core of having, you know, having that initial intro 101 class is the, is the critical foundation. It makes me proud and it just sort of amazes me to look at the number of courses, the fact that it's a minor now, that the number of students that you know participate in the program every year. So I'm, I couldn't be happier that it seems to both have more breadth and, and more depth. Well, in my wildest dreams, going back 20, 22 years, I would have never imagined that a day would come when the Shepherd Program would be the largest minor on our campus. It would just have really been impossible for, uh, I think all of us except maybe Harlan, to have imagined that it could have grown in this kind of way. And today, um, its footprint is pretty dramatic in the greater Lexington area, as well as across the campus. I've seen a lot of growth in the Shepherd program, both in kind of the scope and in the depth programs, like the Bonner program that has evolved from a two-year kind of service commitment to a really deeply engaging four-year developmental program in my time. We've seen the number of students academically engaged just explode. We've had new volunteer venture trips, um, lots of exciting growth in the program. I've never known a Washington and Lee that was not already positively impacted by Shepherd. I certainly know that there are plenty of folks who come to me and say that Shepherd was one of the reasons that they decided to come to WNL. I certainly know that on graduation day, plenty of students come up to me and say that Shepherd has been their home. I can only imagine that that means it has impacted WNL in a positive way. I think it's hard to understate how important Shepherd is, right? Because it, it really is pervasive throughout the entire campus. Um, I think it's really hard for a student to go through their four years at WNL without thinking on some level of the about the complex issues of poverty that we'll learn about in Poverty 101 and through the different experiences. It gives students a sense of like purpose and belonging, but it also binds all of us together on the journey to establishing a more beloved community. It really helps give students this wonderful education and it teaches them about really, really important policy matters. And it, honestly, I think it, it makes the students better people. I think it's really important to give students an opportunity to understand how to be involved civically or to be able to direct their career paths, to be able to make a difference in the world. There's so many issues that overlap with poverty studies and so I really think most students on Washington Lee's campus, having this skill set is important. It's embodying those qualities that we've always said WNL is about. It's about leadership, it's about community, it's about honor. It's a real life example of so many of those things. The Shepherd program has definitely helped me develop a career because before the Shepherd program I had some vague notion of wanting to go into social impact as a career, but I didn't really know what that looked like or what options were available to me. And so through all of my experiences with the Shepherd program, it's opened up a lot of different doors and experiences, and it's reaffirmed my commitment to going into something that matters to me. It helps students get a broader perspective on society and how other factors that they may not have considered earlier impact their own lives and the careers that they choose to pursue. And it taught me an incredible amount about how to approach an issue not just from the scientific perspective but to consider those other disciplines too. In our motto we say that we're not unmindful of the future and I think that poverty because it's one of the most pressing concerns of you know our time and pretty much of every time uh, the Shepherd program prepares students to take on leadership roles in those conversations. To me it's all about transformational change. Uh, poverty is the social equivalent of cancer. It's, it's everywhere. There's lots of reasons for it, some known, some unknown, and it's a, it's a real battle. And uh, what better program to equip our students with this intimate knowledge about poverty and the causes and, and the ramifications. I think that we in Shepherd are focusing a lot on vocational discernment and helping our students to think through, okay, I care and I'm passionate about these issues. How does that translate into my future career or my future civic life or even just the way I'm thoughtful about different situations. And so being able to provide support for that and 
prepare students to to do well in the future is going to be a focus for us as we continue on. So one of the things that I'm most excited about at this moment, on the 20th anniversary of the Shepherd Program, is the leadership that's provided by Howard and Fran, Wendy, Marissa, Jenny, the people who are part of the staff and others who are involved there, and to envision what can be 10, 15, 20 years from now as that program continues to evolve and serve this university and its students, but even more to serve society as those students take their role as professionals and civic leaders in the community. There are always going to be uh, young people who want to figure out how to live meaningful lives that help make the world a more just and welcoming place to all. The goals of the program uh, were in 1997 what they are today, which is to bring interdisciplinary coursework and actual hands-on community engagement together to prepare students to address the wicked problems associated with poverty. The overall mission of the organization, like the mission of WNL, hasn't changed. The particular way that we may do that can change. No program will ever succeed if it rests on its laurels, and that's not what's going to happen with the Shepherd Program. Uh, before we go live, I guess you should have your books open. Uh, I will discuss a little bit more in my second lecture this morning, but uh, uh, we are, we're going to start a view of that at the end. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Gaylard. I'm a professor of music, and we are beginning our course in the Alumni College on the late phase of Beethoven's compositional career. We did a Beethoven Alumni College 12 years ago, 2006, and we did the whole career, but this time we are focusing just on the final phase of Beethoven's uh, life and career. Uh, with uh, a discussion of probably the most significant works in his uh, late phase. The, uh, the context of his uh, late phase, of course, uh, needs to be discussed a little bit, uh, keeping in mind that Beethoven was born in 1770 and he died in 1827. And if you know political history, this is a time of great political revolutions. We think of the American Revolution.
uh, when Beethoven was just a young man of five, uh, we think of the French Revolution when he was 18. So it is a time of change, and I think that's going to be reflected in Beethoven's own music. Uh, it also affects the uh, role of the musician in society, and that we will see Beethoven at the beginning of his career is very typically an 18th century composer who is expected to work for a patron. Uh, a composer is regarded somewhat as a servant to the aristocratic and nobility, but eventually we will see Beethoven flexing his individuality and really paving the way for the 19th century composer who is much more a freelance composer and dependent much more on the general public rather than uh, the patronage system. We have uh, certain places in Beethoven's life that uh, we need to keep in mind. There's Beethoven, by the way, in 1815, really often thought of as the starting <coughs> point of the late phase. So this is Beethoven, now a man of almost 45, right? And, and of course, at this point in his life, pretty much completely deaf, right? This is an uh, issue for Beethoven's studies is the amazing uh, fact that these works that we will be talking about were written when the composer was pretty much deaf. Uh, we have, of course, his origins in the uh, city of Bonn, where he was born in December of 1770. That house is still in existence. I, I had the privilege of visiting that house actually with one of our alums in the room, uh, uh, Press Manning, uh, and I went to visit that house when we were on a trip abroad with the alumni. So there is the house where he was born. His father worked for the Elector of Cologne, uh, who had a palace in the city of Bonn, and that palace now is the university. Oh, I'm sorry, I should mention too, of course, the later a uh, city in his career is the city of Vienna, where he moved in 1792 as a young man of 20, almost 22, and where he lived for the rest of his life. So we'll see, of course, this is the, a picture of Vienna in the year 1800, the Vienna that Beethoven would have known, uh, and this is the entrance to the Hofburg Palace, which of course is the uh, winter palace of the Habsburgs, a very important uh, a family who ruled the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, back in, uh, in terms of musical history, and I'm sure my colleagues uh, Paul Youngman and, and, and Greg Parker will also be referring to the fact that Beethoven represents in a, in a very critical time in musical history as the junction of the classical with the Romantic. We, we think of Beethoven as, in a way, bridging uh, these two musical periods, the classical and the Romantic. And the great German philosopher Nietzsche, in his essay, Birth of Tragedy, uh, refers to the fact that in human nature, we go back and forth between uh, what is represented by the god Apollo, uh, the god of of classicism, if you like, the god who is representative of order, of logic, of discipline. Of course, Apollo also represented the sun. He represented the enlightenment. But we have this notion of classicism uh, in music also referring to the idea of logic and structure and order. And those things are things that Beethoven inherits as a child of the 18th century. But uh, Nietzsche also refers to Dionysus, uh, who is the symbol of Romanticism. Dionysus, another name for Dionysus is Bacchus. He is the god of wine. Uh, you notice the grapes here. Uh, he is someone who represents uh, a sort of sense of disorder, a sense of mystery, a sense of uh, freedom. Uh, and a word that, by the way, was very important at the end of the 18th century is a very important word to Beethoven himself. The idea of breaking the rules, of changing what had been established uh, in both society and, and in music. The rules of music in Beethoven 
are often broken. And we will see that uh, particularly in the late phase of his career. Uh, now, the other thing we often talk about is this uh, duality of going from the cerebral, the more objective idea of art, to uh, the more emotional side of art, the more subjective side. So we'll see this duality very much in the music of Beethoven, the idea of working with some of the established traditions, but then adding one's own viewpoint on those traditions, and often changing uh, those, those, those accepted um, uh, traditions. Uh, let's go on. We, we talk about the classical period. It's usually thought of as the end of the 18th century, the period approximately from 1750 to 1800. And there are other composers we need to mention in connection with the classical style, often associated in art with, uh, or visual arts with what we know as neoclassical. You only have to look around this campus to see neoclassical architectural elements. And we think of the founding fathers in particular, uh, Thomas Jefferson, for example, being very interested in the neoclassical. Uh, but of course, one of the uh, important representatives of the classical style is Joseph Haydn. Uh, often known as Papa Haydn. Notice his dates. He was born in the same year as George Washington. I often think he looks a little bit like George Washington <laughs> with, his, with his wig. Uh, and he is often credited with being the father of the symphony and of the string quartet, two very important genres of the classical period. And those genres are, of course, uh, ones that Beethoven picks up. The other important thing about Haydn is that he interacts with Beethoven. Uh, he is Beethoven's uh, first important composition teacher uh, when Beethoven moves to Vienna in 1792. And, and he, Beethoven studies with Haydn uh, from, we believe, 1793 to about 1795. Uh, Beethoven will actually dedicate uh, his first set of piano sonatas, Opus II, to Joseph Haydn. The other very important name, of course, in the uh, pantheon of classical composers is uh, Mozart. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, perhaps most famous because of the movie Amadeus now, we know in pop culture. Uh, but he is considered the master of the classical style. Notice he belongs to the next generation after Haydn, uh, born in 1756, and of course tragically dies at the age of 35. But Beethoven, growing up, was very much aware of Mozart. Uh, and being the son of a musician himself, as Mozart had been, uh, Beethoven's father was hoping his little son would be another Mozart. Uh, of course, he wasn't quite a child prodigy the way Mozart had been. Uh, and it may have been why we know Beethoven as a child suffered some abuse from his uh, father. His father unlike Leopold Mozart, who was a refined gentleman, uh, Beethoven's father, we know, had an alcohol problem uh, and probably beat his son as he was growing up. So Beethoven did not have the happy childhood that Mozart had. Uh, but Beethoven inherited and again played with many of the forms and structures and genres of the classical period. And Mozart often provides the models for Beethoven uh, in his own music. So we, we, we often talk about the uh, symbiotic relationship between those two composers. Mo he did go and see Mozart just very briefly, if you remember from our big tome, and I understand uh, we are, by the way, using this text by uh, Jan Swafford for the course. It's an almost thousand page book. Uh, but uh, in this book, of course, we do read of Beethoven's very brief visit in 1787 to Vienna, uh, where he met Mozart. We know they met at least that one, once, one time. Uh, and uh, Beethoven was hoping to study with Mozart, but then he got news from Bonn that his mother was dying. And so he went back to Bonn. And by the time he came back in 1792, Mozart was already dead, right? So uh, he did not have a chance to study again with Mozart. 
The other uh, interesting uh, style that has an impact on Beethoven is actually the style before the classical period. And it's going to really be evidenced in a very uh, significant way in the last phase of Beethoven's career, the compositional career that we're going to be considering for this course. And that is what we call the Baroque period. The Baroque period is the period in music from 1600 to 1750. The most important composers, the ones that we still normally perform, are the ones that represent what we call the late Baroque. Uh, and that is really the first half of the 18th century, so 1700 to 1750. Uh, and of course, you, you have, as classical music lovers uh, certainly know the name J.S. Bach, uh, who is considered sort of the master of polyphony. The easiest way to explain polyphony is that Baroque music is different from classical music in uh, a way uh, that has to do with the relationship of parts to each other. Whereas in most classical music, late 18th century music, there's one main melody with an accompaniment, right? Something like uh, a Mozart sonata. We have a melody in the right hand, we have an accompaniment in the left. In the music of Bach, the idea of texture is that there are at least two simultaneous melodies. So rather than having one uh, line, uh, of course in piano music would be the right hand dominate over the left, uh, in box music the two hands are more equal because the left hand will also have a melody, right? So, uh, and typical is to ha the idea of having the melody that is repeated a few seconds later. So you hear the interrelationship of the two parts and they are much more equal. Uh, that is the fundamental principle of polyphony and poly of course meaning many. Uh, we will find Bach is the master of that type of, of interaction of musical parts. And this fascinated Beethoven. Now Beethoven of course was, as his main instrument was the piano. So he grew up actually learning a lot of the preludes and fugues of Bach as as we still do, a pianist, uh, I, I play the piano, I started studying Bach and then played the preludes and fugues of Bach. Uh, also the famous Goldberg variations, a set of variations for keyboard that again interested Beethoven near the end of his career. So we will see Bach's presence, if you like, in uh, the late phase of Beethoven's career. Along with Bach, a contemporary of Bach, of course, is the great uh, composer Handel. Uh, born in Germany like Bach, but unlike Bach who stayed in Germany, Handel studied in Italy and then moved to England and actually became an English citizen. So the English now claim Handel as their own composer. If you go to Westminster Abbey, you'll see his tomb is in Westminster, Westminster Abbey in, in London. And of course Handel is perhaps most familiar to us as the composer of operas and oratorios. The most famous oratorio being Messiah, right? So uh, Beethoven again uh, finds interest in Handel's music and we will see it has a bearing on a piece that my colleague Greg Parker will be talking about on Saturday, uh, the very important Missus Solemnis, right, that great mass that Beethoven writes at the end of his career. Uh, and we also see the influence of Bach, of course, because we have to remember Bach is not only a great instrumental composer, but he's also a very fine uh, vocal composer, writing a lot of choral music again, cantatas, and of course the Mass in B minor, uh, which I think uh, has a relationship to Beethoven's Missus Solemnis. So we have this Baroque element that will start to appear uh, very strongly in the, the later part of Beethoven's uh, life. Uh, we also have uh, patrons. When you read Beethoven's life, I mentioned the 18th century tradition of patronage. Uh, a man who is probably one of the first significant patrons of Beethoven is Count Waldstein. Uh, he gave his name actually to one of Beethoven's most famous piano sonatas. Uh, those of you who play the piano may know of the Waldstein sonata. But Waldstein, who met Beethoven in Bonn, also gave Beethoven an entree into the Viennese aristocracy when Beethoven moved there in 1792. 
So uh, we also have this very distinguished looking gentleman, Prince Lishnowski, who uh, was a very supportive patron to Beethoven. And of course, uh, on the next page, we have Prince Lobkowitz, uh, to whom uh, Beethoven dedicated some of his most significant uh, symphonies. Uh, and of course, on the right, anybody recognize who that is? That's the Archduke Rudolf, now an archbishop, right? And Rudolf, of course, was a member of the Habsburg royal family, but he was also a very talented musician, and he studied piano and composition with Beethoven. So Beethoven, again, I think wrote probably more pieces dedicated to Archduke Rudolf than anyone else. Uh, those of you who play the violin will know the Archduke Trio, for example. But the very famous Emperor Concerto, the Piano Concerto No. 5, was also dedicated to Archduke Rudolf, as was the Opus 81A Piano Sonata known as Les Adieux. And of course, as Greg will talk about, uh, the Missa Solemnis was written to honor Archduke Rudolf. So uh, we have Beethoven very much being uh, connected by the time he's in his 30s uh, and has some very wealthy and powerful friends in the Viennese uh, nobility. And what's interesting about that is that he has provided an annual income by those three last gentlemen, Princes Lobkowitz, Lischnowski, and Archduke Rudolph because they want to keep him in the city and they just say, well, you can do whatever you want, just don't leave the city. We'll provide you with an income. So rather than working for one patron the way Haydn had done in the late 18th century when Haydn was working almost 30 years for the Esterhazy family, Beethoven is given some freedom to compose and just write as much music as he wants to write. And of course, he thanks his patrons by dedicating uh, pieces of music to them. But he's not beholden to any, uh, beholden to any one of those patrons. The, uh, <clears throat> the other things we need to talk about are the trials and tribulations of Beethoven. And they are evidenced by certain documents. There are two very famous documents. One, of course, is the Heiligenstadt Testament, taken from the name of a small town in suburban Vienna, where Beethoven in 1802 was told by his doctors to go and rest away from the big city, just maybe to help what he was starting to feel were ringing in his ears in 1802. But by the end of the six months in Heiligenstadt, his hearing wasn't getting any better. He had written some letters to his friends telling them about his, his uh, condition and how depressed he was getting that he was starting to lose his hearing. And then he wrote this very famous document to his brothers. He had two younger brothers. Uh, the Heiligen Testament was never sent to them. It was found in his belongings after his death. But it does give you a sense of his state of mind in 1802. Uh, and the idea of even committing suicide, because he was losing the one faculty that a musician values the most. So uh, it's a tragic letter, uh, and I'm hoping you can read some of that. Uh, but just to quote some of it, uh, it is, uh, for six years I've been a hopeless case, aggravated by a senseless physicians, cheated year after year in the hope of improvement, finally compelled to face the prospect of a lasting malady whose cure will take years or perhaps be impossible. But what a humiliation when one stood beside me and heard a flute in the distance and I heard nothing. Or someone heard the shepherd singing and again I heard nothing. So uh, there is a, a, a sense of revealing his inner thoughts and expressing his frustrations, his anger. And yet the letter, which of course was never sent to his brother, brothers, uh, also talks about deciding that his art was too important, that he needed to stay here to write what he needed to write. So we should also get a sense that he is deciding he will stay and fight the fate that has been dealt to him. And I think that's what we often get in Beethoven's music, is this sense of defiance, uh, this sense of overcoming obstacles. 
The other uh, very famous letter, and it gives its title to the movie this afternoon, is Immortal Beloved, because there is a series of letters <coughs> written in July. It's not exactly clear what year, though the scholars have detected it was 1812. Uh, the letters known as the Immortal Beloved letters. Uh, this one, of course, is the one that mentions this lady as the Immortal Beloved. Though still in bed, my thoughts go out to you, my Immortal Beloved, now and then joyfully, then sadly, waiting to learn whether or not fate will hear us. Uh, we have uh, the, the, uh, the story of Beethoven's love life is an unhappy one. He kept falling in love with unattainable women, very often the wives of his patrons or their daughters, because he often taught them piano or composition. And he would fall in love with these ladies. Uh, some of you may know his most famous piano piece. What's it called? <laughs> for Elise, right? So uh, again, this uh, sense of wanting a partner in life and never really finding that partner. Uh, there are all sorts of scholars who have tried to deduce who is the immortal beloved. And for a while, everybody was in agreement after Maynard Solomon decided it was the lady on the left, Antony Brentano. But more recent scholars think maybe a previously proposed candidate, Josephine uh, von Brunswick may have actually been the Immortal Beloved. So this afternoon you're going to see the movie Immortal Beloved pr proposes the most preposterous notion of who she was. And I won't spoil the, uh, the suspense in case you haven't seen the movie. But uh, just be prepared. Why most scholars think the movie is crazy uh, is because of the identity of the Immortal Beloved in that particular uh, case. <coughs> Uh, let's talk about the stages of Beethoven's career. A young man, uh, some of his early compositions belong to Bonn, but then we go to Vienna and we talk about the early Vienna years. Uh, this is Beethoven about the age 30, uh, right near the end of what we call his first phase. Like many great composers and creators, we divide his life into early, middle, and late. And the early period is usually thought to end in about 1802, around the time of the Heiligenstadt Testament, because there is a crisis in his life and he decides to fight fate and to go on. And that leads to the middle phase of his career, uh, which starts around 1802, and which, of course, is often called the heroic uh, phase. It's also the period of his life that produces probably his most famous works and his most popular works. So, uh, for example, the Third Symphony st starts the heroic phase and is, of course, known as the Eroica Symphony. Originally planned to be dedicated to whom? Anybody know? Napoleon, Napoleon right? One of Beethoven's great political I I I uh, idols as he was growing up. But, but, of course, he scratched out the dedication. Why? Because Napoleon made himself emperor uh, and Beethoven felt betrayed. So we have this famous scratching out of the dedication. <coughs> I, well, he may have torn it as well, but there's, a, there's a, uh, a, a manuscript you can see where he scratched out the dedication very, very violently. So this is the year, actually, of the Eroica Symphony, 1804. Uh, no, notice those piercing eyes. Uh, I always think Beethoven's very powerful eyes. <coughs> then, uh, of course, we have the period we'll be talking about. And we think of Beethoven's wild hair in his last phase, right? This, this hair that we see in the bust uh, and, of course, in many of the, the uh, portraits from the later years. Uh, this is uh, 1818, and, of course, there's also 1823. He's now, it's hard to believe, he's only, what, 52, 53 years old. I think he, he looks a lot older than that. But, but keep in mind, this is the period of complete deafness. And he will, of course, die in 1827. By then, he is a very famous composer, uh, much revered. And there is the image of Beethoven's funeral in March of 1827, just a few days after his death. And uh, thousands of Viennese showed up uh, for 
that funeral. So that is a picture of the uh, funeral. Now I'm going to move on now to your outline and actually put that outline up here on the screen, uh, focusing in on letter C. So if you want to turn to uh, where I'm going to be, it's the uh, section that describes some of the, the typical traits of Beethoven's late style period. Uh, and I wanted to start with that and then go to musical examples that sort of uh, suggest these uh, uh, features. The thing that we note in his late phase is the, as I say here, the paradoxical extremes of length. Uh, there are very, very long works. In fact, the Ninth Symphony, his last symphony, is his longest symphony. It takes anywhere from 70 to 80 minutes, depending on how fast the conductor chooses the, the tempi for those four massive movements. And of course, there is the Missus Solemnis. Both of these works are works my, my colleague Greg Parker will be talking about in the Ninth Symphony tomorrow and the Missus Solemnis on Saturday. Uh, the Missus Solemnis is even longer than the Ninth. It is about 85 minutes, 85 to 90 minutes in length. So it's an extremely uh, vast piece of music. Uh, on the other hand, there are also examples in the late phase of very short, concise movements. Uh, so we have two-minute scherzos in the uh, late phase. And we have very compacted first movements, uh, often uh, contrasting with very long last movements. So uh, there are these uh, very extreme uh, sizes of movements in Beethoven in his late phase. Uh, related to that is probably the most important structure of the classical period, the structure that Haydn and Mozart perfected, uh, known as the sonata structure. This is a structure that we find usually at the beginning of any instrumental piece, the first movement of a concerto or of a sonata or of a string quartet or of a symphony is in what we call sonata structure. But Beethoven has always been playing with this structure, the structure he inherited from Haydn and Mozart, but in the late period he distorts the structure. He often expands certain sections of the structure or again he compacts them and makes the sonata structure lasts much shorter than you would expect it to. So we'll find, again, uh, the sonata structure is not always as textbook example of a sonata structure uh, the way we learn about it in music history classes. Uh, the third thing, of course, as I mentioned earlier, is inspiration from the Baroque period, especially in his use of polyphonic textures. So we will see in his late phase an obsession with one of the most popular or most uh, identified structures of the Baroque period, which we call the fugue, right? So we will see fugal uh, elements in many of the Beethoven uh, late works. He is also attracted to another structure known as the theme and variations. I mentioned the Goldberg variations of Bach, but we find in Beethoven's late phase, this is one of his favorite structures, is to take a theme, present a theme, and then keep repeating it, but each time he repeats it, it has something different about it. So it's a, it's a way of sort of playing around with an idea and elaborating upon it. Uh, this is something that may have something to do with his own skills as a performer. One thing we do know about Beethoven, he was a wonderful uh, improviser, right? He could sit down at the piano and play and ideas would come to him and he'd play with those ideas and people would come just to listen to him improvise. And I think the, the theme and variation structure is a sort of outgrowth of that ability to play with an idea and to v transform it and to generate new ideas out of the original idea. <coughs> I, I keep talking about this notion of simplicity and complexity. It's a duality in his late phase. Uh, we also find in his late works the idea of tonal uh, relationships that are unusual. Now again, I'm getting into a technical side of music that I don't want to pursue too much in this particular class, but just keep in mind that there are traditional notions of the way you start in one key in a piece of music and then maybe go to another key. Well, the process is called a modulation, right? From one key where you have a theme may be presented in a particular key like D major, uh, 
And then the second theme may be in a contrasting key. Uh, typically, if you start in D major, it would be A major. But Beethoven changes those rules. So he will sometimes go from D major to B flat major rather than the more expected A major. And that has to do with this notion of different tonal relationships. There's also, of course, in Beethoven's late phase, the idea of dissonance, right? The idea that you have a beautiful chord, what we recognize as a major chord. You might create some dissonance by adding a seventh. But if you add a ninth, you're starting to create some tension in the music. And that tension is because there's more dissonance in the music. And Beethoven understands the effect of dissonance in creating a sense of emotional, uh, expressive heightening of a certain moment. Chromaticism, very easy to explain chromaticism. Literally, it means color. But in music, we usually go up the scale stepwise, right? But if we start going by half steps, so I'm, instead of playing all the white notes of C major, I'm also going to add now the black notes between the white notes. What we call half steps, that's what we call chromaticism. And we'll find much more of that uh, in Beethoven's experimentation with tonality in his late phase. The vocal impulse. Uh, Beethoven is a composer we think of generally as an instrumental composer, right? His, his great works are the symphonies, the sonatas for piano, uh, a lot of chamber music, of course, the string quartets, uh, and the piano concertos, or the concerto for violin, very beautiful concerto. Uh, not so much the vocal music. It's true he wrote one opera, Fidelio, and of course he wrote the Missa Solemnis and uh, some other religious pieces. Uh, but there is an interesting aspect to the late phase, which means uh, even his instrumental music starts to sound vocal. He even starts to use vocal terms when writing instrumental music. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate that uh, a little later. But the, the idea of, of cantabile, which is the Italian word for in a singing style, he often uh, will put that as a direction to an instrumentalist. So make the violin sing like a voice. Or make the, the right hand of the piano, if it's playing a melody, sing like a voice. Uh, so there is a vocal impulse. And of course, the most famous thing that happens is that he redefines the symphony. You know, you think of a symphony as normally a work for orchestra. But what does he do in the Ninth Symphony? Last movement, he sets the Ode to Joy, right? The Schiller Ode to Joy is then set as a vocal piece. Big shock. Symphony is no longer a work for orchestra. It's a work for orchestra voices and chorus. So uh, there is that uh, even uh, found in, in his, his changing of, of what a symphony is. We do have vocal music in his final symphony. Uh, we find an expanded range of color. And, and I'm particularly interested in this because uh, in the piano writing, and I've been told that when you go deaf, that what you lose first is the middle range notes on the piano, right? The ones that, that would be played in the middle of the piano in here. But you can still somewhat hear the outer extremities of pitches, right? The very high and the very low. And one of the uh, examples where I feel this, this might be Beethoven still sort of reaching for sound is in his very last uh, uh, sonata, the final sonata, piano sonata, where we get a passage like this. <clears throat> Isn't that strange? That's the very low end of the instrument and the very high end of the instrument. And it's, I think it's Beethoven still trying to hear those sounds uh, in his music. So uh, one of the most striking and to me one of the most beautiful moments in his final uh, piano sonata is the passage I just played for you. Now that's related to a notion of ethereal, uh, an otherworldly quality, what we sometimes think of as a religious, almost ecstatic uh, 
Uh, there's something like that in the same movement that I just played for you, where he gets very high and has a trill. doesn't sound like the piano music we usually think of, right? It's got this, this color that's quite different uh, from some of the more famous uh, piano sonatas. And time is measured differently. I mentioned the, the length of the Ninth Symphony, the length of the, of the Missal Solemnus, but also there's some moments in these pieces where you feel time is almost stopped, right? There is a sort of notion of eternal length. And that is something I'm going to share with you in a moment from, uh, there's a, one of my favorite moments in the Ninth Symphony where I think it, it occurs. So with all that in mind, I want to keep that on, but I want to start playing you some music, some examples uh, from the different genres that we will be talking about. Um, in particular, of course, first the piano sonatas and the uh, sonata uh, that is the first of the three final sonatas, Opus 109 in E major, uh, sonata number 30 is, is usually its numbering uh, in the list of 32 piano sonatas. Um, it's unusual a little bit because it ends with a slow movement. Uh, the last movement, the third movement of this sonata is a slow movement. It's a theme in variations and it's marked uh, andante molto cantabile ed espressivo uh, at a walking pace with great uh, uh, much singing style and very expressive. That's the Italian uh, wording here. Uh, it's one of my wife's favorite movements, actually, in Beethoven. I'm playing it partly for her. <coughs> an almost, don't you think, hymn-like quality to it, but it's very songful, it's very soulful. Uh, it is very vocal. Uh, now, it begins a set of variations. Keep in mind, this is a theme in variations. Uh, one of the variations sort of illustrates the polyphonic aspect of Beethoven's late style. Listen to this. these interweaving of different lines. Uh, there's an imitation going on there. There's that wonderful change. I don't know if you were aware of it, but he suddenly takes us into a different harmony than we expected. <laughs> What's that doing in? Okay. So we get these incredible uh, harmonic changes, those sort of unexpected uh, tonal changes in, in that. Now, uh, the other thing I mentioned there is the, the idea of a trill. Uh, trill is a sort of alternation of two very uh, close notes in music, right? The idea of... It's like the vibration of sound 
and it becomes important in his late uh, piano sonatas. Listen. that long trill in the left hand how long it lasted right so uh, it's it's uh, it's a challenge on so many different levels it's a challenge technically I think it's also a challenge emotionally right it, Beethoven's late music really drains you in a way because he requires so much expression as well as as technique uh, let me get back into the system I thought oh no I've lost my connection okay so let's go to some of the other uh, genres uh, and this is uh, stealing the thunder I'm afraid of of my colleagues in a way but I wanted to share with you uh, some of my favorite moments in some of the other late works of the of the uh, Beethoven's uh, music and the first is the Missa Solemnis right this uh, vast setting of the mass ordinary we have five traditional movements the Kyrie the Gloria the Credo the uh, Sanctus and the Agnus Dei. Uh, but we also, uh, of course, have models of many different settings of this text by famous composers. Perhaps, again, Bach's B minor Mass is in Beethoven's mind. We certainly know Beethoven knew Handel's oratorios. He knew uh, the Messiah, for example. Uh, but I wanted to play a little bit of the opening of the Gloria. Anybody know your Gloria text? You go to church. The words at the beginning of the Gloria are glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we worship you, we glorify you. Of course, in the old days we used to say thee, didn't we? We said we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee. Uh, but uh, there is this setting of the Gloria which is, as Greg said last night, fasten your seatbelts uh, because it's one of these huge settings and he keeps repeating those first four lines of the Gloria text. I thought there's no better person to watch conducting Beethoven than a man that we are celebrating this year and actually someone that was the subject of our alumni college two years ago, uh, Leonard Bernstein. Uh, we have him conducting this movement. I think in this particular recording Leonard Bernstein looks a little bit like Beethoven by the way, you know, with his, with, with his Beethoven hair. Uh, but just think about some of these elements I've been talking about as it applies to the very opening of this Gloria movement from Missa Solemnis. <clears throat> <clears throat> Gebouw in Amsterdam. 
course, the most famous movement in the ninth is the last movement of the ninth. Here we have Sir Georg Scholte uh, conducting a concert in the beautiful Royal Albert Hall in London. Anybody been there? The vast concert space uh, and where, of course, music resounds so beautifully in that hall. Uh, the moment that is the surprise moment in the Ninth Symphony is that the last movement begins as an instrumental work and then a baritone solo shows up about nine minutes into the piece. And I wanted to play that moment because... <laughs> Well, that melody we don't need to go over too much, do we? It's one of the most familiar melodies of Beethoven. Uh, I think it's so appealing because it is so simple. It moves very regularly on the beat most of the time. It has a very easy range. It's why it has become the anthem of the European Union. It's easily sung. It lies within a fairly narrow range for the voice. My favorite part of the, of the theme, by the way, is this part. We suddenly have these jumps, and there's a syncopation where we come back to the main tune, not on the beat, although when you sing it in church, they've made it simpler, so you actually have the return on the beat. But Beethoven's original has it coming back on the second beat, not on the first beat. Anyway, I'm getting off the track here. I, I want to go to my favorite part of this movement, which is where the text changes to uh, uh, accommodate actually a new melody, <coughs> and this melody is heard with the trombones and first the men of the choir singing these words. <laughs> the and you'll see the tr text translation in a moment. <laughs> Schiller's words. <laughs> Now, talking about uh, jumps and a contrasting melody to the one of the Ode to Joy, uh, do you notice the difference here? We have uh, a melody that actually jumps quite a lot, right? It goes... That's a horrible interval for basses to have to sing. You know, they go from a low D up to a high E. <laughs> So, uh, it's almost like a chant, don't you think? There is something chant-like about that. That melody will be picked up by the sopranos. Mentions the Father, the Creator, beyond the stars, reference to the starry skies. Incredible set of harmonies that come up here. <laughs> 
rather unexpected changes of harmony. Now it's going to start soft. It starts to going to rise in pitch. Now listen for the way the harmonies go up, keep changing, and then arrive at a very unexpected chord at the top of this series of chords. my favorite moment. This to me is a glimpse of the eternal at this point. He's, in the text it's saying, do you not see him, the creator, above the stars? And the music suddenly becomes very soft. Uh, the harmony is somewhat dissonant. You'll hear this chord. And you'll hear the woodwinds pulsating as the chorus sustains the words over this pulsating or compliment. It's just one of those breathtaking moments. <laughs> Now what can you do after that? Well, after that, he decides to put the two melodies. Remember the joy melody and the sight and schlumen red melody? You put the two together, like a Baroque master would do. So you have this wonderful feat of compositional technique as we get back into the normal mood of this movement, which of course is the joyful movement. <clears throat> Do you hear the two melodies going at the same time? And this is a voice killer. Any choral person will tell you when Beethoven asks the sopranos and the tenors to keep singing high A's over and over again, it just kills the voice. Listen for it, it's coming up here. <clears throat> mm. So he's asking the most out of his performers as well. Mm. Here it comes, listen to these sopranos. Repeat. <laughs> well, as usual, I'm running out of time, so I'm not sure I will go to the string quartets. I trust my colleague Mark Taylor to talk about the, the very final works of Beethoven's career, uh, the, the great six quartets and the Grosse Fuga, uh, which sort of culminate uh, his entire compositional output. But they do demonstrate many of the qualities I've, I've talked about today as representative of the late phase. So let me just 
provide you with some final thoughts on uh, Beethoven's late phase. Uh, I think one is the idea of contradictions, the idea of simplicity, directness of, of expression with complexity, uh, especially the complexity of the compositional uh, process and the, the idea of suddenly providing us with uh, a massive overload of musical ideas after giving us such a simple melody like the Ode to Joy. The other thing is the idea that Beethoven is really burying his soul. He'd been obsessed, of course, with the Ode to Joy for almost his entire life and finally found the musical setting for that text. It's a very personal thing for him. And yet, it's also a universal piece, right? It is a piece, as, as I think Greg will discuss, and you will see in the movie on Friday uh, about how the Ninth Symphony has become so meaningful to many cultures around the world, not just the Western culture. But I didn't know this until recently that, did you know in Japan, New Year's Day, they have these huge gatherings of choral singers in big stadiums. And what do they sing? They sing Beethoven's Ninth. Uh, at the beginning of, of the new year. So uh, there are all these uh, wonderful uh, functions now, Beethoven's music, as music that represents uh, the yearning of mankind for something better. It's why, by the way, some of you probably remember this, I, I could have shown it, I don't know if Greg will show it, but of course Leonard Bernstein uh, conducted a very famous performance of the Beethoven Ninth when the Berlin Wall came down. You remember that? That was also uh, at Christmas time, it was on Christmas Day of 1989, a very famous uh, performance of the Beethoven Ninth in Berlin with musicians from all over the world playing in the orchestra and singing. Uh, and of course, he changed the word. You remember, he changed the word from joy, uh, Freude, to freedom, Freiheit, right? So uh, it is a, a very powerful performance of the Ninth associated with Bernstein. Uh, we also need to mention, of course, that Beethoven was an innovative composer. He, he belonged to the classical period, but he uh, really looks forward to a new age, the Romantic age, because he's often changing uh, the structures. He's trying to expand the emotional weight of a piece. Uh, he is uh, somebody who is objective in terms of his approach to composition, but also very subjective in sharing his own uh, tragedies with us, right, in his music. And that means that his music is perhaps more powerful, uh, more compelling than much of the music written uh, before him. The, the other thing, of course, connected with that is the political aspect of Beethoven's music, because he was a child of the revolution. He was idealistic. Uh, eventually, he was realistic. Uh, he was optimistic and pessimistic. Uh, he, he had this, of course, pessimistic view of his own life and his deafness and his success, uh, lack of success with women, and yet he still provides with his music, I think, a sense of optimism, uh, the egalitarian aspect. The artist is hero. The artist is someone who's important to us in society. He's a composer who really sees himself as important in giving the rest of mankind a message through his art, through his, his music. And indeed, I think he accomplished that. Uh, there is, if you like, in his music, an interest in humanity. Uh, it's very much, I think, reflected in this late, late phase. And of course, the legacy that he leaves to the 19th century is that rules are made to be broken. Uh, he really opens the door. The Romantics see him as their standard bearer. Uh, go for the infinite, go for the unattainable, go for more expression than you thought you could ever have in music. And so when we think of Schumann and Liszt and Wagner, Brahms, Mahler, Richard Strauss, these are all great uh, 19th century composers who look to Beethoven as their model. And then, of course, even the 20th century, we think of, of Arnold Schoenberg, Dmitry Shostakovich, and our own Leonard Bernstein, right? These are all names of the 20th century who are inspired by Beethoven. So we're just about on, um, to embark, on, I think, on a very exciting series of days about this period, and I thank you for listening today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Questions?
Yes. Yeah, the peak of Napoleon and Waterloo in 1815 mm -hmm. and the Congress of Vienna in 1815. Right. Did that, did that have a particular impact? Well, Beethoven actually wrote a piece that uh, is known as Wellington's Victory. It's not a very good piece, but he, he was somebody who was asked to write music to celebrate that defeat of Napoleon. I think Beethoven always had mixed feelings about Napoleon from, from what I gather. There were certain things he still admired about the man. Because uh, when he was asked about Napoleon, he thought it was a shame that Napoleon had been exiled and put on the island and, and no longer was of use to mankind. It, it saddened Beethoven to, to see Napoleon uh, reduced to that figure, uh, having been such a heroic figure in the 18th century or the late 18th century. Uh, but Beethoven, uh, there are certain pieces that he wrote to celebrate the victory of the Allies over Napoleon. In, in the Congress of Vienna, there are some pieces. They're usually not considered that, that very fine works of Beethoven, but they, they were written for a political purpose. Yes? Tim, um, the Ninth Symphony must have been so unusual for yes. the Viennese public. Yes. Um, can you tell us something about the initial reception of that? Well, Greg will probably have more to say about it. My sense of it is that it wasn't very well performed because it was so hard to perform. We'll so, talk about that as yeah, well. yeah. So uh, it probably didn't have the impact that it has on us now because it didn't have as as good a, a hearing, perhaps, you know, I mean, literally, uh, as as we we hear nowadays. Uh, I mean, it does require a tremendous amount of of organization, of uh, ensemble playing, of vocal stamina. Uh, and my impression is they didn't have enough rehearsals to do it really as well as it should have been done. Was it his practice to conduct his pieces even after he began? Well, the, again, there's a story there. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of Greg's thunder. I I'm apologize to Greg for this. But my impression is, again, they were told not to look at Beethoven. He insisted on going up on stage and waving his, his arms. But of course, they were told to look at some other people on stage because he couldn't hear any of it. And the tragedy, uh, I don't know if you'll tell this story tomorrow, but the, the tragedy is that when it was over, he was still beating time with his back to the audience. And the, the alto soloist had to come and take him and turn him around to see the audience was already on their feet. So uh, you know, then everybody cried because they realized he hadn't heard it. I mean, he had heard it in his head, but he hadn't actually heard it being performed. Yes? Does current research agree with stuff I had read from earlier that the Hammerklavier Sonata, the Ninth, yes. and the Gross Fugue were all originally conceived of by the performers? These are hard to play. We're having trouble with these. Oh, definitely. Yes. I mean, the Hammerklavier took ages for anybody to really, I think it was one of Liszt's uh, piano students, uh, Hans von Bülow, who finally said, I think I can tackle this. But, and it's similar, I mean, with the string quartets. I mean, Julia can tell you about the string quartets, the late string quartets. Some people told Beethoven, these are unplayable. Ray last night mentioned that she, she got into the music and noticed there were 10 key changes in one of the movements. And, and he starts in five flats. And string players do not like flat keys, especially there are five or six flats in the key signature. So uh, Beethoven is always challenging his performers in the late phase. There is a story, I'd love to tell this. I'm not sure it's apocryphal. But one of the sopranos in the Ninth Symphony, first performance, actually complained to Beethoven about uh, the vocal writing. And he said, what do I care about your voices when inspiration strikes me? <laughs> so just suck it up, so to speak, and do what you can with my music. But that is sort of the challenge still to this day uh, with this uh, late period music. Anything else? Yes. The soprano was complaining. Did he read your lips or did she have to write him a note? Well, <laughs> it's good. We, you know, what people did to communicate with Beethoven is they wrote what were called conversation books. And we still have those books. People actually wrote down uh, what they wanted to ask Beethoven. The, the sad thing is he didn't write down his answer because he just spoke. So it's sort of like hearing a, a conversation on the phone where you only hear the person in the room with you, but you don't hear what the other person on the other line is saying. So. Uh, th that's what the conversation books are like. But we do have a fair number of conversation books from the late, late phase of his life. <clears throat> yes? What we know after his death is the cause 
of his deafness. What? I'm sorry, I didn't get what the first part. What caused his deafness? Well, there are many theories. Uh, there's one recent one about lead in the water of Vienna. Uh, another one that you'll see in the Immortal Beloved is that his father beat him so badly when he was a child. So uh, there are all sorts of theories on, on that. Um, it's, it's hard to know for how sure. Serious is, how serious is the thing about potentially lead killing him? Because I see that on a... I'm not a chemist or a scientist, so I can't really tell you. But I think we've got to go. We've got to go and get a picture taken. So, yeah, it's time to... Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mm-hmm.